While Nate is coming around, just as Mitch was sharing with you this morning, just a couple things I would offer that, just to touch on what he was emphasizing. Number one, for us as United Methodists, this is particularly exciting because to me, this is a reclaiming of our roots. And uh, a lot of folks will say that the last significant movement in the United States was the Methodist movement. And Mitch, again, touched on that, that. Again, to me, that's a reclaiming of who we are. Secondly, you heard him indicate that this does not have to be financially intensive. Now, in fact, you can do this really for little to no money in lots of ways. So I think that's significant to remember. And then also the formal and informal discipleship. I loved what Mitch highlighted for us in that. Interestingly, when you look at the life of Jesus, it was that informal or behavioral discipleship that he really did so often. And so again, I think that's just interesting for us to think about. So questions that you all have over here. Over here. Oh, so I have oh, the mic. Should I'm sorry. I go? Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had the mic. Go ahead. Sorry. So we're the co-children's directors at our church. Co and my what? I'm sorry. The co-children's directors, um, Don and I are. So my question is, where are the children in these fresh expressions? I mean, are we bringing our children to the open mic nights? And, you know, or the pub? Um, so where and how do you disciple the kids that are... I mean, if we're talking about 30-year-olds, young families are in that group, and so there's that extra component. You just took a bite, so is it me? Cool, yeah, so, so that, uh, that's a great question. Um, one, of, one of my answers to that, um, and I have, a, I have a couple, one is we need more people like yourself asking that question. Um, and so while I have examples of what that looks like, I actually have an example of one that is outside of a pub. Um, uh, down in Florida, um, there is a fresh expression that exists out th uh, down there um, that the owner of this pub and bar said, hey, we have this big old space, and do you think you could do some commu like family community events? And the children, so basically the, the person that in your role at the church said, hey, I love this idea. Um, and, uh, and over time has created different family-friendly activities for people that uh, that are drawn to be there. And over time, um, that has created a, uh, a, f a different family feel, and they, uh, they explore different discipleship things, probably in a little bit more of a traditional way, um, but outside of a pub, and then connected under this like awning thing. So, but it's a little warmer there, so being outside is a little easier for them. Right, so, right. But that's one example um, of, of what that looks like um, that way. So. I would also add on to that to say, what would it look like to say that children are our common interest when talking about building a fresh expression and building on from there? Particularly when we talk about Christ himself referencing children as often being the ones who get faith more. What would it look like to build out from that that would involve children and families? That's one. And a second one I would lift up is Mitch lifted up one example. Another, these are a little bit older kids, but I know of a fresh expression that began with, uh, it was centered around a need that was recognized in a community was that a lot of parents had to work from like three to 6 p.m. And so one church recognized that kids were unoccupied at that time, essentially started an after school program, but then used that to build relationships. From there, they got to know the families. The families started getting together to build community, which led into a Bible study, which eventually led into church. All of that stemmed back actually from the children. Yeah, it, there's one other really neat example. This is more event-based, and so take it for what it, what it is, but there was like, there's a mud day, which uh, if you, I don't know if you know International Mud Day, it's awesome. Uh, but you basically uh, invite, uh, the, this, this place in North Carolina invited the entire community together for this mud day, as in the church did it, but basically at the end, they were covered in mud, obviously, and they basically got to give like a seven minute small message about look how dirty just physically dirty with mud you are right now this is what we believe um, is that jesus wipes away all of that dirtiness um, and we'd love to tell you more about it now that's more of an event but it was that was all families and it was super cool because they asked for the children to pray for their parents um, and to wipe away the mud from their their forehead so 
Um, so there's uh, you know, the creativity, uh, I mean, and that's where you come into play, um, is that that's your, er your area of expertise and your passion. And I would say, I wonder what it would look like. Great, thank you. Yep, thank you. cool. Over here. Okay, can I ask my question yep. since it's right here? Sure, sure. Okay, please. Um, I'm interested in your recommendations on the best way to uh, communicate to a congregation yeah. that is very traditional and who measures vitality primarily by Sunday morning worship attendance. <coughs> you want that one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I I want that one too, but I'll let you take that. Uh, so one, I would say a couple things. I like to talk about a macro and a micro approach. So the macro approach is that whatever you can communicate from the official church places, so sermon series, uh, newsletters, pastor pages, Bible studies that would be around acts, like all of those kinds of things, I think are ways to start to drill down on that and try to change the culture some that way. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit more this afternoon. Uh, but the other thing that I would say is, so seek as much encouragement, permission from the established church as you can. But I also think that we who are able to offer a voice of permission need to just give that to the appropriate folks and set them free. And so then what you're doing is at the appropriate time, as people who have been set free, when they're starting to see lives changed in these fresh expressions, we can start to share back those stories to the rest of the congregation. And hopefully through that process, you're both educating them, but also inspiring them. Most churches I found, no matter how traditional they are, at the core somewhere is still the desire to see God be glorified and lives changed for God. And if we can lift this up in any way that relates to that, then slowly but surely we can help them start to do that. But if we wait for the day when the church is suddenly like ready to go with this, I think we'll be waiting a very long time. Yeah, and, and so and this, is, this is one of the one of the wonderful things about what Pastor Matt has done is that he has freed me up in a very large way to do this. And so um, and that so that means that I'm not leading worship. That means that I am uh, I'm I'm not at the church very much at all. Like I have an office, it has been Years since I have had a full day at the years, my my office is in the community, right. but that means that there has to be a willingness on the permission givers of the established church to say this is where this person's heart is, and we want to affirm it. Just like the example of hey, they're overseas missionaries, that we give them permission to go and exist in these spaces. We need to do the same thing locally, and that might mean you don't have lyrics on a Sunday because the person doing the lyrics really doesn't want to be doing the lyrics. What they want to be doing is going into the community. The, the person that is ringing the largest handbell might be like, all right, I'll do it, mom. Right? Like, you know, and so like, I was that guy, right? And so I love handbells. Chimes are also good, um, but uh, but there might be people in your context that it might it will mean that something inside of your traditional experience might not be accomplished on that Sunday because you said we need to free you up and we don't want to overtap you. But having said that, one of the great beauties in this to me is that for the most part, a Sunday morning worship experience does not have to be disturbed. Like all the stuff we're talking about is happening Tuesday nights and in other places. So right. literally it's almost like no skin off my back. Like that's how it, I think it even began for us. Like, oh, if you want to really do this, okay. Cause you're not really getting in our way. Mm -hmm. What they didn't know at the time is how much it would influence us and our culture over time. But now that they're starting to understand it and see what's happening, we have a ways to go too, but it is changing. Yeah. Right. Thank cool. you. Great, Great question. question. Great yeah. question. If, if one of the goals of a fresh expression is discipleship, you know, on a, in a safe, you know, a third space, um, what do you do when a group ends to maintain discipleship with people that maybe have been growing but aren't interested in something else? How do you keep that connection with them when maybe their interest isn't, isn't running at that point in time? Right, yeah, that's a great question. So Mylan is a great example. Um, and so Mylan gave his life to Christ. He was, a, he was, he was a training to be a bodybuilder. 
Um, and obviously FitFaith, as Matt said, doesn't exist anymore. So I've, I've continued to meet with him personally, but I've also helped him connect to another, a different local congregation that's doing different things, maybe not exactly that same way. And so I've done, I have, I, I've done that work that way. Um, and so, and even for the rugby, rugby can't really meet outside during the winter because it just hurts. And so throughout, <laughs> literally, um, and, so, uh, and so I've been meeting with Heath and Greg, uh, John, um, throughout the winter months. Um, and actually that's more, again, you heard me talk a lot about uh, more behavioral discipleship. We've actually been doing more knowledge-based discipleship throughout those winter months. I mean, we'd get together and hang out have a beer, um, but we, we talk, we've, been, we walk, we've talked about the Psalms, uh, we've read Timothy, because they're younger dudes, right? And so, um, so there's different ways that way that we have really, um, really ha uh, seen that happen. The last thing I'll say is that, is that over time, as much as we talk about our end goal is not necessarily for them to, to come to, to be part of our church, as we build trust with these people, which is a huge part of what we're trying to do, they actually are more likely to come to church. And so there are a handful of people that, even though that has come and gone, they've said, oh, well, this is the type of church I want to be a part of. So. so part of what you hear Mitch explaining there is if you remember back at the very beginning of this morning and we were talking about in a culture people want to experience, you hear Mitch in a couple of different ways there, particularly with his one-on-one -on -one meetings, helping be, like we talked about, the guide at Westminster Abbey. In many ways, Mitch will get very creative to say, how do I continue to walk with you step by step, even if it's not in exactly the setting that we began in. So it does continue, but it involves reading that context, continuing to be creative, and being intentional to keep walking in the steps with the, fo with the folks. Right. Cool. Yeah, great question. I thought there was another one over here. No? I don't know. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Yep, we got another one. How do you measure and communicate success? How do you measure and communicate quote unquote success and like, you know, give people the words of what you're celebrating as opposed to what their measure of success would be? Part of the, what we're trying to do, so there's a reason we're showing you some of the videos that we have. We'll be showing a couple more later this afternoon. When you, when you saw the summary from our church of what the Axe Network is and what Mitch was describing, that was a way to try to educate our folks to say, here are these expectations. It's going to look a little bit different. We're trying to be creative in the metrics that we come up with. We're also trying to let words like experimentation, creativity, a celebration of failure. <laughs> like We're trying to let those things become part of our culture and environment so that there are different expectations. And then, again, we've, we've referenced Mylan a couple times, but at the end of the day, even if you're the most traditional worshiper on Sunday morning, if you hear that a life has been changed, like, there's an openness that comes with that, that then there's more permission and more willingness to move in the direction of fresh expressions. So, I, I, so even though we have a, a network of these at fresh expressions, I don't lead all of them. I don't lead, actually, the only one I really lead is one. And so I'm a part of three, um, which means that there are leaders on campus in the community that I work with personally. And so we talk a lot about what those successes are. Um, how much time um, have you been in this space? How many people, we talk about this orbit thing, yeah. not, att not average attendance, but how many people are in orbit? Um, and so like maybe they've come into orbit, like, and maybe they go out and they, they come in. We value that very, uh, in, to a very large degree. Um, how many, how many uh, we talk about um, uh, how many non-believers or how many disenfranchised people have we connected with through this? That is much more important to us than average attendance um, uh, because average attendance can oftentimes be basically a group of Christians that have shifted their huddle from this place to this place. Right. Um, now that will happen to a degree, but if we keep asking that question, those leaders are constantly asking and then asking those Christians that are there to say, who can we be inviting that into this experience? Um, and so it's just a constantly like reframing, like this is why we're doing this work.
The other piece I would add to that, and again, we'll get into this more this afternoon, but so the light process, metrics around what does it mean to listen? So how many conversations with non-Christians have we had this week? How many prayer walks in the community have we taken? Evaluate that. Uh, igniting around loving and serving. So how are we identifying ways to love and serve? Now, the other thing that we'll do in terms of evaluation is, uh, Mitch is very gracious with me, uh, to, the, to the church as a whole, we are as much as we can lifting, educating, but Mitch will tell you, I am also pushing him on which of those stages, so if, some, if there's a group, if rugby has been at the Ignite stage for a while, I start to ask him questions of then, okay, that's great, but when is the gathered starting to happen? Or if they've been at gathered for a while, that's great, but now help me understand when we're going to start transitioning to heightening around discipleship. Right. And so we develop our own, I mean, part of it's just the intentionality of having the conversation, but under each one of those steps, you can start to have metrics under each of those that help you keep moving yeah. forward. And let me just say, part of the beauty of the journey is that, is that we get to uh, give validation to listening. We get to give validation to building a community. Um, and again, if we think about traditional church plans, there seems to be a, a pressure um, that we need all of those things to immediately exist, mm -hmm. right? That essentially we have a space, we're doing worship right from, the, from moment one. But again, um, like how did churches really start to form in the first place? It was by them just building a community with each other and eventually yeah, people were like, we should probably get a space and, and have it grow. But we, we're at a place where we, the, the, the examples we have. So use that journey um, and that assessment. So even if you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm at the beginning of listening, we get to say, great. Yeah. That, that means it's the beginning of, the, of, a, of, a, of a fresh expression. Yeah. We don't say, oh, finally you're at a fresh expression. You're doing worship right. in, in the, on the mountaintop. Prayerfully, that'll happen. But we understand that we didn't get to start doing the, what we're doing here for two years. Two years of drinking coffee, of woodworking, playing games. I mean, like, yeah, throw me in the briar patch, but still, right? Like, but still, that's what it takes. And, and um, uh, going back to earlier of saying, this just takes time. I think that's a great point. Uh, thanks for mentioning that, Mitch, because if you were right, if we're saying this only counts when you get to the end of like experiencing church and that thriving, then Mitch is right. Like, that's not what this is about. The intent is to get there, but it's just as valid at stage one with the listening. And just to give you an idea, uh, we've had the, 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 our Tuesday night group has been worshiping. So it's been at the, you know, the T stage thriving for a while. But just recently, the yoga one has gotten to that stage, now, and it was, its dynamics were a little bit different. And maybe this is a good transition. Here at the Pajama Factory, we are pretty confident that by the end of the summer, early fall, that we will be doing some form of that here as well. Those are the only three right now that are actually worshiping. There's a couple others that might get close in the next few months. We're okay with that. We right. just continue to listen at the right time, the right prompting, the movement of the spirit. We trust we will get there. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so why don't I do this? Let me, I want, I'm going to walk you through just a little bit of what has happened here. So as a case study, kind of lay out the picture for you. And then you guys are going to take a walk with Mitch and actually kind of see the rest of this in person. And we'll have more time this afternoon for questions as well. You're welcome to catch Mitch and I individually. Uh, but let me just walk you through. So again, just to give you a concrete example of the lights process, what that looks like. First of all, I want to say one of the really great things for us, and you all know this, but none of us do this stuff alone. And so I can be as excited about this as, as possible, but without a Mitch in our midst and presence, this doesn't happen. So you just need to know that on, on, on his behalf, and you need to know that Mitch, he has many gifts. I mean, he's one of the few people I've ever met. You can literally plant him anywhere, and he just connects with people because it's this simple. He loves Jesus and he loves people. And he's exceptional at just living into that. And I'm so grateful for that. So thank you, Mitch. The other part of that, though, is this. He has a humble enough spirit that we, uh, he could very easily feel put off by me or the established church. Like, you've boxed me in way too much. And there are times that we have those, those we go like this. <laughs> but Mitch has such a heart and believes in this so much that he 
He's been willing to help us learn and grow. So you just need to know that. Uh, you pray for Mitch's in your midst. And let me tell you, they're there, but, but also don't ever take them for granted. So Mitch can do what I can't. I marvel at his ability to meet with so many different folks and just move them along. I, it's a gift God has given him. Um, and I, I am so grateful for his presence among us. He's literally helping our entire church culture change. So I want you to know that. Now, I share that, too, to say... In terms of this space and how do we end up starting to meet, it began with Mitch. He began listening, uh, literally walking the community, noticing what is needed. Our, our established church facility is a number, it's about, it's about two miles, but it's sort of on the other side of town from here. Mitch just noticed there was not a lot happening here. And as he was literally talking to people, there were two needs that he started to recognize. One is for families around these facilities. Uh, there's a lot of brokenness, and so literally hunger and food issues. But even bigger than that, he noticed a longing for community, but people weren't finding it. When you're talking about building and taking time, one thing you need to know again about Mitch, I don't even know how many hours he has spent literally in this facility, many nights till 2 a.m., talking with the artists in their studios, getting a sense of the pulse of this place. So when we're talking about listening, it involves that level of listening. Now, because he did that, he was able to accurately identify needs in the community that can be ignited. And so in doing that, again, he recognized the hunger thing and the community thing. And he started to say, what can we do about that? As he's thinking about it, praying, all of these things, he starts to have conversations and he talks to the owner of this facility. What do we find out? The owner is like, you know, I don't want to use this for a corporate business and a big manufacturing whatever. It's like, I really want it to be used for the betterment of the community. And so when Mitch was like, well, I have some ideas on what that might look like, wide open door from the owner and the, other, the Lisa that he mentioned, people of peace. I mean, they could have easily said, you're not using our space. You don't get to do this. They didn't. They were just happy it was going to be used for the betterment of the community. Because Mitch had been all listening and spending time with folks, he has validity in this place, from the coffee shop owner, to these owners of the facility, to the neighbors. And Mitch was like, I think, what would it look like then if we could use some of this space on a Monday night? What would it look like to pull people together, have dinner, and start to build a sense of community? And so again, he talked with people in the neighborhood, he passed out information, he verbally invited them, and at the same time began forming a team that would help us gather in this space. So again, moving along the lights process. The first night, that what we decided to do at first was to try a seven week trial run. Yeah, and, and uh, seven weeks, it was very intentional. Uh, it's very, uh, and, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but it's, it's very common for churches. Uh, whenever we start something, we kind of think it's gonna, it should last for right. 47 years. Right. And if it, and if it doesn't, then somehow we are the biggest <laughs> failures on the face of the earth. So, yeah. so with, the, with the emphasis of prototyping, of saying, we're going to give it a go. We're going to get a fair shake. We're going to put as much energy into this as needed. When, like, and let's, let's go. You know, send it. And so, then, uh, and, so we, and we said, at the end of the seven weeks, if it's not working, we're done. Yeah. We're just going to reassess, use that energy somewhere else. We're going to trust that God's going to use that energy. We didn't say, we're going to start this, and if it doesn't work, right? yeah. <laughs> well, and there was so much freedom in that. Because one, if we get to the end of seven weeks and it hasn't met a need, great. Or, fine, we've learned. What will we change for the next time? If it continues to work, great. So it's, it's sort of almost no lose by doing it that way. So we started, and the first night especially with Mitch and crew, is like, is anyone going to show up? And there were about 30 that came that first night. And then over the course of the seven weeks, it actually grew. So by the end, it was about 60 or 70. Now, what I want to say to you in this, because a lot of people have questions on this, community comes, night number one, we don't want to do a bait and switch along the way. So literally the first night, Mitch and a guy named John are helping lead this group, and they literally say to everyone who came, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're your neighbors at First Church. Would it be all right if we offer a prayer as we begin? Like, it was that simple. So they knew from moment one, we're from a church. Like, there was never going to come, there's, there is never going to come a point where they're surprised at that. They were very open to pray. And then they ate together and had community, and Mitch brought in music, and all of these things. That's all they did in that first week. But again, there was no hiding who we were and are. Over the seven weeks it grew, we realized at the end of the seven weeks, we think we have a real opportunity here. So what Mitch did with his crew is right out here, 
they had to keep up momentum through the summer. We weren't prepared to keep doing a meal every week. So they said once a month over the summer, let's have summer picnics. Uh, that kept the momentum moving, kept spreading the word in the community. That's where a whole bunch of people showed up. And then last fall, we started back on our weekly, and he used those opportunities to say, you know, in July, in August, starting September, whatever, we're gonna continue back with every week meeting. And that's where now, you know, 60, 70, 80 people a week are coming. Now, the guy who's leading that primarily is not Mitch, it's a guy named John. And what he's done and what Mitch, again, as we move through this process, where we've gotten to the point of is that now when they gather on Monday nights, it's the opening prayer, now, John will often do a, what, five-minute devotional-ish, something like that, or a small message of some kind. Three to five minutes. It's, yeah, small, yeah. but it's a little bit more than what it had been. And what we think is possible is that we now have enough relational capital that John is considering sometime probably this fall extending an invitation to anyone who is there that after the dinner is over, we're going to invite you to come and join us in further conversation, which can create an opportunity. We understand it'd be a much smaller group, but that's then where we can enter even more into discipleship opportunity. Yeah. The other piece in that I would say when you talk about loving and serving, we now have people on Monday nights who are helping with the dinner themselves. And so that is a help. Uh, and they're increasingly taking ownership as well. So we're not at the place of worship yet, but we are moving along that continuum. And we're pretty sure, again, that we'll get to that place yeah. that I just mentioned. Yeah, we, we have families that are asking us to provide worship, actually. They're saying, if you did Saturday night worship, we would show up. Um, so I'm pretty confident if we were to do that, um, we'd probably get 15 to 20 right off the bat. Um, but, you know, again, we're trying to be, we're trying to stay with, this journey and not basically not um, um, just be sensitive to what could happen to get creative with it um, and just not move before we're we're ready to move yet yep. um, and so but there are beautiful things happening like the you know some artists are, are looking to bring their their artwork and show it during the dinner um, some people that have in like sell maybe if you have the community come and sell some of what they make we want and we really talk a lot about how um, how we want to be a blessing this place right. that the people that are showing up um, that a lot of them actually it's amazing. A lot of people live within a block or two of here, but they've never actually come in here until now. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. And so we, they've gone and they've like, we've, we introduced them to all these different places. And we're like, buy from them, bless this place, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, show, that, show them that support to help build this community. So it's not just come, we want them to bless us by showing up to our thing. Mm -hmm. But again, we want to be here and saying, how can we be blessing this location? Mm -hmm. um, and, and not just by giving them a meal, but then by giving them business. Mm -hmm. And by, um, you know, I think we're going to be doing work on someone's house. We helped someone find a job last week. Um, and so he's helping Tommy, you know, mm -hmm. with construction stuff. And so like those types of things, the people showing up, we really want to be intentional about really helping them um, wherever they are and blessing them. So that, again, I just lay that out to you to say, I hope you hear in that the different steps of the lights process and just practically how that begins to be a reality or can become a reality uh, in, in a setting like this.